that everybody has a copy of the class book that we're using? Does anybody not have a copy of the class book we're using? Laura, would you like to have one to look on tonight, to have your own copy to look on? Bill, would you do the honors, please? You know, for um, speaking of my experience here, I can say that for uh, the greater part of 26 years, our studies on Wednesday night and Sunday morning in the auditorium class have been textual studies. We have looked at books of the Bible using the, the sheets that we print out for, uh, with questions for our study guide to, to um, uh, focus and ask questions, but it's still about the text. And we've, we've made just a few exceptions along, and we do feel that it is prudent occasionally to do that. But uh, we do plan, you know, the, the, uh, the most basic thing we can study is the text of God's Word, and we need that. And so it's worked real well for us to have the uh, format of Sunday morning Old Testament and Wednesday evening New Testament. We try to have balance in that way and continue to, to just methodically go through. But as you know, currently we're uh, doing a study on premillennialism uh, along with the, uh, not only the auditorium class, but pulling in uh, the uh, younger class as well, the uh, junior high and high school class as well. So we're looking at the subject of premillennialism, and uh, remind me, does this have 11 lessons in it altogether? Is that what it has? Am I right about that or wrong? It has 11 lessons. So we're, we're, we're really on track with that. We're, we're covering, uh, it's kind of like ready or not, here I come. You know, we're, we're covering one lesson per class. And uh, it, it has just turned out that Billy uh, has, has needed to do the lion's share of the teaching on Wednesday nights um, as we have been, uh, it has just turned out, uh, we have been need, needed at uh, South Carolina to help with Owen, and we wanted to be with them, of course. So consequently, um, that's involved with being away some Wednesday nights and uh, gave me the opportunity to visit with brethren at uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and I'm glad of that, but you know, not under the circumstances. But anyway, tonight I'm glad to teach one lesson number five. And this is a book by Jeff Archer, who preaches with the Jordan Park Congregation in, in Huntsville. And uh, what he does, his approach on this, uh, you can see, for example, if you're open to lesson number five, does he have page numbers on this? This is page 21, right. All right, it's, I see that now. Uh, lesson number five, page 21. What you can see, the, the format he uses is to, first of all, quote from those who are premillennialist. And not just somebody that you know would not be representative, but people who are widely read, people who are who have taught a lot, and so that when you read what they say, you're not just saying, "Well, here's what they believe," and with some possibility of misrepresenting them, but rather you're you're just quoting from them on on basic matters. So Jeff has researched this so that there are key quotations, key points that he's making about the doctrine. So we're not having our, 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 um, our approach is not to be attacking people, but we're dealing with a doctrine that we believe is contrary to the Word of God. But the way he approaches that is to, first of all, focus on which aspect of premillennialism he wants to talk about tonight. He's talking about the, the concept that Jesus came to establish an earthly kingdom, just like the Old Testament kingdom, a restoration of that kind of kingdom of David. He came for that purpose, according to the doctrine. But because he was rejected by the Jews and crucified, then you go to plan B. And so at some future time, he's going to come again and, uh, and do what he came really to do the first time, but did not accomplish. And so what he's doing here is, is some quotations that show uh, that that is the uh, premillennial position. Secondly, what he does is to have questions, but, but what Jeff is doing is he's asking, you know, if I use the word leading questions, I don't mean somebody's trying to manipulate you, but asking leading questions in, in terms if they lead into the various, he's breaking down the subject with passages so that you're seeing what these passages say in contrast to the position. So. I think that's a good approach, even though, you know, you just glance at a lesson, it looks like, well, 
you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, him writing about this. And that's right. But he's, he's trying to simplify it, give representative quotations, and then for us to do the work of going to the, to, to the Bible on related passages with questions framed to deal with uh, the various points of premillennialism that, that he has in mind. Like tonight, we'll be talking about this matter of the rejection of the Jews. Was that something that was anticipated by God or not? And uh, what does that mean about the kingdom is at hand? What about Jesus saying that? And then what about uh, the, the nature of the kingdom? Those kind of things. So passages that will, that will do that. So you understand that our work is cut out for us. But my, oh my, the temptation is so great. You wouldn't believe how great the temptation is to review just a little bit, but I can't do that. But you've got basically three positions on millennialism, which is a thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. Uh, post would be that comes after Jesus' return. A millennialism would, would be a denial, that's what the Bible teaches, which is what, what we are. And then uh, pre-millen- premillennialism is what we're talking about. Jesus' return, setting the kingdom up and reigning on earth for a thousand years. So that's that's what that means. Again, very few people believe in post-millennialism now, but that used to be, for example, in the days of the restoration movement in this country, it was, it was, a, it was widely believed. It's just that you and I are not likely to run to any, into anybody that, that believes that. It's more the matter of premillennialism, again, pre-meaning before, the idea of, of Jesus uh, coming, second coming, preceding, coming before, a literal thousand year king reign on, with a kingdom on this earth. So that's what, that's what that means. And this is commonly taught. One of the better writers and students of scripture I know is a man named uh, Irvin uh, Jenning. And um, he wrote a book entitled Inductive Bible Study. That's a really good book. And several guides on, he's one of the best to me at grasping the overall contents of a book and putting it where you can make sense of it. And, and putting charts together. He's good at all that. But the but is he is premillennial. And this is, this is one of the, the charts that, uh, that he made. And this, this kind of thing is just, is just very commonly taught that now we're living in the church age. But then later you see, in other words, after Jesus ascended, he set up the church. And then, then next there's going to be this millennial age. And, and then, then after that, of course, you've got You've got eternity. One thing that has been pointed out, and uh, we, we looked at this, so I'm not, I'm not covering it, but in, in the first lesson, what Jeff pointed out is that according to premillennialism, there are seven dispensations. And he doesn't really elaborate on those. But I, I, have, uh, I, I have procured uh, uh, DVDs from people that teach this, as well as uh, uh, writings. And, and they're all consistent in terms of teaching seven dispensations. And so what they're saying is that we're in dispensation number six and right now, the church age, the dispensation number seven is going to be, you know, this reign on earth. And uh, then that's, that dispensation will end with a great judgment when eternity will begin. So uh, this is... Uh, this is when when he talks about the seven the seven uh, dispensations you know it's that that's it these are the seven dispensations we're in number 6 according to the doctrine number 7 is when Jesus comes sets up his kingdom and then you've got a a, a judgment scene and uh, eternity so that's that, that is that, that by the way is from Tim LaHaye he's another very um, uh, popular author on, on this subject. Hal Lindsey is another one. By the way, um, I'm not advocating you go out and buy this necessarily, but years ago when I was studying, in fact this was uh, nearly 40 years ago, I was studying in a special study under Homer Haley, uh, premillennialism, and at the time this was fresh off the press, and Hal Lindsey, and it's called The Late Great Planet Earth, because another one of the tenets of premillennialism is not only is Jesus going to come again to set up the kingdom, but they almost all say, and he's coming soon. 
They just can't get, get away from this date setting thing. And, uh, you know, after this, I, I received a, a booklet from somebody, I forgot who wrote that, but it was called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Come in 88. And they just, they can't get away from this date setting, which is why the late great planet Earth, I mean, he was teaching that the second coming would be imminent. So that, that goes along with it. And of course, we know that no one knows the day or the hour. We know the Bible teaches it will be as a thief in the night. And there, there won't be signs whereby you can predict when the end of time is near. By the way, if you want to get something that will help you in your study, Robert Whiteside, I brought these down to remind me to tell you, the kingdom of promise and prophecy. Brother Whiteside was especially known for his easy to understand commentary on Romans, a very meaty book, and he wrote a good commentary on Romans. This is called the kingdom of promise and prophecy, and it's, it, it is well done. The Florida College Lectures of 1986 are the Doctrine of Last Things. And these are some great resources that will, that will take you further. You know, anytime you're interested in something, there's, I view this as kind of an introduction, but uh, there's always, if you want to study further and go deeper and help with your understanding, there are a lot of resources there that uh, I'm glad to, to recommend. So uh, what we have here is, um, again, you, you, you see this concept of the Old Testament economy, and now, see, they make this distinction that uh, here's the church age, and so then there's this rapture where the church is caught up with Jesus to be in heaven, and then, according to the doctrine, when he comes, so they've got him coming two times. They've got Jesus coming here, but this is invisible. Then they've got Jesus coming here, uh, and that will be visible. But bringing the saints with him, setting up the kingdom, reigning for a thousand years. And then the destruction of the earth, the final judgment, and the new heavens and the new earth. So this is, this is uh, not trying to be repetitious, but this is kind of common. This is core belief. And, and what, I'm, what I'm doing is this, is this is stuff straight from them, these uh, charts that I'm showing you right now. And, and you see what they, they may vary on some details, but what they have in common is this concept of, of here we're in this church age, and they usually have in common the concept of the rapture, and uh, where the saints are caught up, there's this terrible tribulation on earth. Now we have shown carefully as we studied Revelation, we started out by emphasizing that these were the things in the first century that John said would, Jesus told John, would, sh how does that go? R would shortly come to pass. That's the emphasis of that book. It's for first century Christians in those seven churches, things that they would be facing, they and their children would be facing, it would shortly come to pass. What premillennialism does is to take the thrust of the book of Revelation, as you see, and, and put it beyond even where we're living. At the time, in other words, they'd say, well, it could be at any time. But the point of it is, they'd say, this has not been fulfilled yet. This is yet to come. So this is kind of in common to premillennialism. We're in the church age. What is coming up here is later the, the kingdom on earth. And so that's, that's, again, from them. Now, the biblical view, of course, you've got a time. You've got the eternity before time began. This represents in the beginning. This would represent the Old Testament economy from creation down to the, in time to the cross. And then, of course, Jesus' resurrection and ascension back into heaven, where he's on the throne. He's Lord in Christ. He built his church. He established his kingdom. And so we're, we're in this time, the last days, the last dispensation. But then, at his second coming, there will be a resurrection of the just, this is, this, these lines kind of blot this out, but what this is saying, a resurrection of the just and unjust. In other words, a resurrection of, of all who will appear before the throne. And we will again, time will be no more. The earth will be destroyed. It will be eternity for the saved in heaven and for the lost to be banished into eternal punishment. Now that represents what the Bible teaches. See how simple that is? And, and that's truly representative of what the Bible actually teaches. There will be a resurrection. Remember what Jesus said, the hour cometh in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. So you don't need a degree in, in uh, 
in Hebrew or in ancient uh, Mideast studies to understand what we're talking about. Now, any extra study you do can help you. But it's kind of like if, if, if somebody has all these elaborate schemes that get you away from the plan of salvation and have you praying the sinner's prayer or have you saved by faith only. You know what you need to remember? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Isn't that right? So it's not like we need complexity to answer. You know, it's like, well, look at that chart. He's got seven dispensations and all these other things there, so I've got to have a complex answer. No, you don't. Uh, just, just stay with what the Bible teaches. And uh, the thing about the Bible, it is so profound. But God intends for it to be understood by the common person. Remember when Jesus was teaching, it says the common people heard him gladly. And the common people still, still hear him gladly. And so I, I maintain, and, and uh, as elders, we've talked about this uh, from time to time, that yes, it is helpful to do word studies, and yes, it's helpful to study the original languages and, and, and all of that, but we have a book that God has given whereby we can come to understand his will, what he wants us to do. And I'm not saying that there are no difficult passages because Peter writes of some things that are hard to understand doesn't say impossible. There's the milk of the word and the meat of the word, but when you boil it down, this right here is what the Bible teaches on, on this point. Now, what, what you can do is to, uh, for your own review, you need to go, which I'm not going to itemize this, but you need to go back to the first chapter, uh, which is the introduction, um, which is what we took this from in our very first lesson, to, to see that here are several features of this doctrine. Now that's on page six. And so you, you can review that and, and then you can think in terms of passages that will answer that. For example, on, uh, just to get you started, for example, on that first one. Here's the kind of students I want you to be. You read that first one. God has not fulfilled the land promised to Abraham. And I want you to immediately think of Joshua 21, verse 43, and verse 45, where that is stated positively, and then it's stated in a negative sense, there fell not aught of any good thing that the Lord had promised all came to pass. So that's either true or it's not. But this doctrine is, well, now God really never did actually fulfill the land promise. So again, I can't do that with everything, but what I want you to do is to understand these are the features of it and, and be able from the scripture to, to answer those. So again, these are tenets of that. Okay, the first thing in, in, on page 21, uh, I do not have um, this uh, uh, first source that he mentions, Pentecost, things to come. But what he is quoting from this, from this author, uh, is, is typical, this is, uh, this is what premillennialists say about the kingdom. What they're saying is, yes, of course, we know it says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Anybody can read that. We know it says that. We know Jesus said that. We know John said that. So they don't deny that's there. But here's what it said. And this is just a summary of that. What they're saying is that in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is going about his ministry, and when he says the kingdom is at hand, he means the restoration of that Davidic kingdom. And, and he is inviting people to come to that. He's inviting people to come to that for the first 11 chapters of Matthew. But what he's saying is that um, the withdrawal of the kingdom is recorded, and he says in the events in chapters 11 and 12, it's the great turning point in this Gospel and so starting in chapter 13 in Matthew, does anybody remember what Matthew 13 is about? The parable of, there are seven parables. The parable of the sower is one of them. It's, we can, let's just call it seven parables about the kingdom. So the point is made that, uh, so you see, starting here, Jesus is talking about the mystery of the kingdom. So now here he's changing this. And so we're in this mystery stage now 
which is, is, is the, the reign that we now have of Christ in this more limited sense, is, is the church age. And so that's the mystery that he now introduces in Matthew 13. So what this, I don't know, you know, if you, if you uh, followed all that, when you, you know, you, it's the kind of thing you have to read that and say, now what, what, what was he saying there? And then, and then read it again. But when you, when you read it and read others as well that are saying the same thing, you, you see the point that they're making is, yes, Jesus uh, said the kingdom was at hand. John said the kingdom was at hand, meaning the Davidic kingdom on earth, the reign of Christ on earth, on the throne of David. And he does this for the first 11 chapters of Matthew. But then, do you remember in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is rebuking the three cities where he did most of his mighty works. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. He mentions Chorazin. Uh, Bethsaida and Capernaum because of their unbelief. And so, so what, what, uh, what the position is, see, he, he's withdrawing the offer because they didn't believe. He's withdrawing the offer because they're rejecting him. And so then there's a shift where the teaching now is, is, has something different in mind after this. So if you're wondering, but how do you get around the kingdom is at hand? How do you get around passages like that? I'm not saying that that answers it, that that gets around those passages. I'm only saying this is the position. Now when it says, uh, uh, when it, uh, he, he has a more, a, a fuller quotation from Ryrie. Uh, I, I did, I got this today off Wikipedia. Dr. Ryrie. Uh, what Wikipedia says is a writer and theologian served as professor of systematic theology and the dean of doctoral studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. Has anybody not heard of Dallas Theological Seminary? I mean, this is one, this is one of the most important um, training centers of the Baptist denomination. And uh, the professors would be very premillennial. Um, uh, and it's not like they don't produce any good scholarship, but, but I'm saying this is not a fly-by-night. This, is, this is, has a lot of status. Besides, of course, he's uh, had other professorships. And, uh, but, but have you ever heard of the Ryrie Study Bible? Does anybody have that Bible? In that, he is the editor of that. It contains more than 10,000 notes of, of his explanatory notes. And it's so more than two million copies. He is a notable advocate of premillennial dispensationalism. Now, all of this, what I did, this is just, you all, you all know how to, well, I might have to expl explain to Brother Pender, but you know, you know how to copy and paste in your computer, right? So you got one source. Just kidding, Brother Pender. Although it's really true. But, I mean, but, but, but what I'm saying is, instead of that being what I'm saying about him, I just, you know, copied right from the document and put that right into PowerPoint like you're seeing it right here. So it's just a quote from that. So this is, if, if you're wondering, well, now who is, who is this guy here that, uh, and, and this book, The Basis of pre, the Premillennial Faith, that it, see the bottom line that he's quoting from? I do have, I do have that book. So what, and I say that just the reason, I, that might not have come out right, the reason I was saying that is not to boast about having the book. It's just saying besides this quotation, I can turn and see what context is in and, and read the rest of what he has said. And so, but again, what Jeff has done, this is, it's like, you know, give us the main point kind of thing. And on this about the kingdom, we're, tonight we're talking about the kingdom. And, the, and, uh, and, we're, and we're talking about the purpose of Jesus coming. And so what you have, and, and what, what I did was, was to go to my source at which uh, has this quotation right here and a little bit more. But Ryrie says, all the evidence points to the confirmation of the visible earthly kingdom as first promised to David. Let me see where your quotation. Yeah, this is a little bit before the quotation here, I think. Um, so, you see, let me, just, let me just stop a minute. I was telling Linda at dinner tonight that if I were to say that people believe that Jesus came to earth to establish the same kind of kingdom you had in the Old Testament, a restoration of the Davidic kingdom, 
that my impression would be, but you know, people would not believe that. Or that's surely kind of misrepresenting what they believe. Because it's, it's so contrary to my understanding of Scripture to say that. I mean, but what you have here is not just me telling you that's what they believe. Here is a leading advocate with his doctoral degrees, training men that are in pulpits all over the nation and writing notes that people that buy the, the, the Bibles read everywhere. And he's the one that's saying that the, that the kingdom announced by John the Baptist, and notice he says the content of the early, see that word early? That's, that's the first 11 chapters of Matthew. That's the content of the early ministry. There's going to be this change, see, and, and the disciples whom he commissioned. But then he says, in the mystery form of the kingdom, the crucial point in the interpretation of the Davidic covenant, the kingdom of heaven, and this is in your notes, which Christ faithfully offered while on earth was the very same earthly messianic Davidic kingdom which the Jews expected from Old Testament prophecies. So what he's saying is that what the Jews rightly expected was what Jesus was offering. Do you see that? And that's what John was saying. The Jews were expecting an earthly kingdom with a reign there in Jerusalem. And he says that's really what Jesus came to do. And Dr. Ryrie goes on to say, certainly the kingdom was not set up when Christ was on earth. Instead, it was rejected. However, the kingdom of heaven in mystery form was established at the first Advent. The word Advent means coming, at the first coming of Christ. And I'm not sure if he means in the ministry or meaning as a result of his first coming at Pentecost at that. But, but this is what I'm talking about, the mystery form. In other words, that's going to be the church. So you see, here he goes on to say what we were saying a while ago. That's in Matthew 13, the Lord is introducing the mysteries of the kingdom. That is something that was formerly unknown, but now is revealed. The kingdom was not unknown in the Old Testament. He says the kingdom itself. But the mystery form of the kingdom was unknown. Now, now you have to keep in mind when he says mystery form, he's saying what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 13 was unknown in the Old Testament. And the thing, therefore, that, is, that Jesus established as a result of his first coming, that, I, that also was unknown. So we don't have the fulfillment of those Old Testament prophecies yet. That's what he's saying. And it says, and could not be known until Christ, uh, that is talking about the mystery form now, could not be known until Christ's genuine offer of the kingdom had been rejected. So this mystery form, that's after he's rejected, it's the mystery form of the kingdom of which the Lord speaks in this chapter, that's Matthew 13. <coughs> And look, look here. This is the form in which the kingdom is established in this present age. This is all important for it shows ultimately that the present session of Christ is not the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Now what that means is, you go back, remember 2 Samuel 7, that Peter quotes from in Acts 2 and says in Acts 2 is being fulfilled. David being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath that of the fruit of his loins he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He said he was speaking of the resurrection of Christ. And he said, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made this same Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. But what he's saying is no. That what we have in this present time, this present age, this form of the kingdom, the church age, that's not the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. So that's saying a lot. The Jews rejected Jesus. So what we have is something else than what he had in mind first 11 chapters, chapter 11, 12. That's the pivotal turning point. Starting in chapter 13, he has something else in mind that was unknown to the Old Testament that he's talking about. What we have is not just a simple misreading of Scripture. There are a lot of consequences if those quotations are true. For example, if it indeed were the will of God that Jesus established his kingdom on earth, 
then what you have and, and uh, for him not to be re rejected and crucified, then what you have is salvation being extended to, the, to those people without the cross. If Jesus hadn't been crucified, uh, he would not have been crucified were it not for his rejection and, uh, of the Jews and delivering him to, to the Gentiles. And so what they have is a system where you've got people enjoying God's blessings, enjoying salvation, having it all, and that's really God's purpose for Jesus to live and reign with them on earth. And so you've got salvation being extended without the cross. So you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of basic problems. It's, see, this is the reason why Peter warned in 2 Peter chapter 3, and he's talking about the subject of the second coming of Christ and things that Paul had written which he said the ignorant and unsteadfast rest or twist as they do also the other scriptures to their own destruction. When you twist the scriptures about the kingdom, when you twist the scriptures about the purpose of Jesus' first coming and the cross and all that was done, uh, it, is not a, it is not a minor point. I mean, these are basic things of, of the gospel. If we miss this, if we don't understand the role of the cross and the foreknowledge of God and the present age being the fulfillment of all that was said in the Old Testament, I mean, what difference does it make what else you understand? It's like you've missed the whole point. Aaron? So is it correct to say that they feel that Christ's coming and this presentation of the kingdom was to present to them what the Jews were looking for was a failed attempt? Did, did they feel like it was a failed attempt at that point? People are cautious to say Jesus failed. But, but the, because the plan was rejected, another plan was implemented, and what he came for the first time is exactly what he's coming for the second time. And it's an interesting thing if you look at the question. Last question on number 23, if we could skip to that just uh, to, to connect with what you're saying. Uh, the question, uh, Aaron, both those questions are there. First, number A at the bottom, does this qualify as a failure on Jesus' part? Well, you, you, wouldn't you have to say yes if, if he failed to accomplish what he came to do? Uh, it's interesting, when Jesus uh, prayed in uh, John 17, he said to the Father that I have accomplished your will, which you sent me to do. But anyway, number letter B, will Jesus be able to accomplish his goal of establishing an earthly kingdom at his second coming to earth? And then Jeff says, what if the Jews reject him then? What, what guarantee do we have uh, when he comes the second time for that purpose, it's going to work then, if it didn't work the first time. I mean, is that not a fair question? But the assumption is, no, now when he comes again, that time it will succeed. But see, there are a lot of, there are a lot of assumptions in that. Right. Bill? I don't get the sense that the Jews are on the move to uh, accept Jesus today. Just to carry the law of salvation. Well, that, that is for sure. Um, let me tell you, o over and over, and uh, you know, you're going to have to do some work on your own with, with these questions here. But repeatedly, these, you know, to say, that, oh, oh no, this is not what the Old Testament's talking about. Repeatedly, the Old Testament talks about Jerusalem to come, Mount Zion, uh, Ezekiel 48, verse 35, the name of the city shall be Yahweh Shammah, the Lord is there. And the Hebrew writer will say, we've come to Mount Zion. And he shows that it is a spiritual, it is a heavenly Jerusalem that we have come to. But uh, this, is, this is the very thing that the Old Testament foretold. So, some of the problems with premillennialism, it denies that the church is a matter of Old Testament prophecy, and yet Paul says that the gospel was promised to four by his prophets in the Old Testament scriptures. I thought this was a good one. Agrippa before Agrippa, Paul said that he preached nothing but what Moses and the prophets say should come. 
But in, in his preaching, he preached the church as being the eternal counsel and foreknowledge of God. He preached the church as being the, the bride of Christ. But he said he preached nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would come. Premillennialism says there's not a single prophecy about the church. That what it says about the kingdom is yet to come. And what we have now was not prophesied in the Old Testament. Paul said, I'm not preaching anything except what the prophets and what Moses said would, would come. So, uh, here again, I'm, I'm, I'm observing time, but, but notice this. Was the rejection of Jews a surprise to God? What, what about Isaiah 53? Yes or no? Plainly says he would be rejected. Isaiah speaking... 8th century B.C. And in John 12, that passage was quoted. Uh, in fact, did the psalmist prophesy the kinds of things that would happen to the Messiah in detail? Yes or no? Did the rejection of Jesus, number three, force him to change his plans? Now, the passage cited in Luke 24, do you see how skillfully Jeff is doing this? It, it's showing that that in the preaching of the gospel, it is, it is following up on that, that this is what it foretold the Christ would do and the message then of salvation that would be preached. Is it true, did the Jews reject Jesus? But the offer was made, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest in the same chapter. Um, when, you, when you read yourself Matthew 11, Matthew 12, Matthew 13. Are you aware Jesus is making some kind of shift in his teaching? Does it strike you that there's this pivotal point? And up until now we had one, one offer and one view of the kingdom, but now all that changes? No. You know, there are some things that you, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what happened. We're going to have to quit. A friend of mine is caught up in this. He just has swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. Another friend of mine, Who's part, uh, whom, whom I had a part in this conversion, was asking him, he said, where do you get all that stuff? He said, oh, I was just, I, I just studied the Bible on my own. I just studied the Bible on my own. And he kept pressing, where did you get that stuff? And he, well, the, here's a good resource, and there's a good resource. And what we found is that what he is now saying was just right down the line about the seven dispensations and about all these other things. And sometimes You've heard the expression that you have to have help to misunderstand something. It's simple enough, you have to have help to misunderstand it. And that's the way it is on this deal of saying, you know, it's one thing in the first 11, 12 chapters, and then after that it's something different. You have to have help to reach that position. But these are folks that are offering that kind of help. So as I say, uh, do that with the rest of these uh, questions and you will see uh, that the inconsistencies in the position brought about just by reading the pertinent scriptures that are listed. But we must stop for now.